Hello everyone and welcome back to the Retro Recall. I hope you're doing awesome. Today we're going to be building a PC, specifically a Windows 98 PC. Why? As I've been asked many times on the channel, well, because I want to. <laughs> and there's something about this original hardware that brings back a pile of memories, the nostalgia of working with the hardware, facing the challenges, installing the software, getting all the games installed, things like that, that brings back a pile of good memories and a pile of nostalgia from back in the day, that really emulation and, you know, online streaming services and things like that just don't bring back for me that this does. So I'm excited to bring this all to everyone today. We have lots to do. Let's get right to it. Welcome back. So before we go and go over all the different components I'm going to be using in this particular build, I just want to preface this by saying that this entire choice of hardware is something that I want to do. That's something that I worked with and I feel is going to be pretty good for my needs and what I want to do. Now, obviously people have different standards when it comes to sound cards and video cards and memory and things like that and hard disks and different flash memories. We'll talk about all that in a moment. But I just want to preface it by saying this is very subjective. So again, use this only as a guide. This is something that I am doing for myself and I want to share with everybody here. Okay, so we have the motherboard, the, the main component of the entire build. And we're going to go over this uh, briefly here. So we do have an Asus P3B-F motherboard. And I'm choosing this motherboard for a couple of reasons. One, it's been sitting in a box, <laughs> just taking up space and dust, and I definitely want to put it into some good use. But more than just that, you can see that it has a very large array of options here. And we're going to go over those options. So we do have four banks of memory, giving us lots of compatibility and lots of expandability, depending on the use case of this particular build. I'm using this for Windows 98, so it's going to require minimal memory. However, if I wanted to put in a different operating system, say Windows 2000 or a different OS, I want to be able to expand the memory I can. This gives me a lot of flexibility that other boards may not. The other thing I will call out is this has an Intel 440BX chipset, which is very stable, runs very well in the environments, and has a lot of very um, a lot of compatibility with different hardware. So I definitely wanted to include something like that in this build. We have an AGP slot here for advanced graphics, which is wonderful. We also have dip switches here, but we also have this board has the compatibility to utilize the dip switches to change the frequency of the memory, the AGP port, as well as the CPU. But we also can utilize when they're all in this position with the jumper turned on, we can actually have the BIOS manage most of this, if not all of this for us. So, you know, it gives that compatibility. So you want to do it manually or you want to have the BIOS do it for you. So here we also have the six PCI slots, giving lots of expansion for different types of cards. We also have the legacy ISA port here as well, which is beautiful. So as you can see, we have a wide array of ports to give us that compatibility and expandability for various options. I like motherboards like this because it gives you lots of versatility. Okay, let's take a look at the, uh, the I.O. here. So we have two PS2 and two USB. So again, depending on the operating system, depending on what you're going to be doing, you have the ability to use the legacy connections with the PS2, but you also have the ability to utilize any sort of operating systems and hardware that have USB. We also have two communication ports, COM1 and COM2 here, as well as a printer LPT port here. Again, giving us lots of different compatibility and options. The other thing I look for on a motherboard like this is the connectivity in terms of your, your connectors. So, I mean, we don't have any SATA on this. This is obviously too old for SATA, but we do have the two IDE ports up here. We have the primary and the secondary here. And then we also have a floppy 
uh, floppy controller here as well. So, you know, it's great having all of these on board. And again, I always am leaning towards the compatibility and flexibility for various builds. Now the CPU itself, that's already in the computer here. I'm just gonna go ahead and take it out. And here we are with the CPU. We have a dirty, because it does need to be cleaned, slot one, Pentium three, running at 600 megahertz. This is just a really good, well-rounded processor for this build for different reasons, for being able to turn on and off the cache, being able to do different things based on the compatibility if you're gonna be running old DOS games, as well as uh, you know keeping up with the Windows compatible games as well. So that's something that I like to use. Now, I mean, obviously I do have other ones here. I can run this one here, which is a Pentium 3 400 or 450, I believe. Yeah, it's a, it's a 450. So again, I can go ahead and do that, but I do love using a slightly better processor in order to be able to have that wide range of compatibility and flexibility. As I mentioned, it's quite dirty, but we do have the uh, ability to clean that here and we're gonna do that today as well. Okay, the other thing I'm gonna pull out here is the memory. So I'm not exactly sure what this memory is. This was in the board while we, uh, when I got this out of the box. I do have two options here. I can either go with 128 megabytes of memory or 256 megabytes of memory. Now, I, I've gotten different feedback over the different videos that I've done saying, you know, 128 is more than fine for a Windows 98 build. And I've had others, you know, having, you know, 256 is the kind of the sweet spot for different compatibility of newer games of this era, as well as being able to play the older stuff. And quite frankly, I'm gonna put in 256. That's just what I'm going to do, because again, I like that flexibility and having that there. So that's what we're gonna be doing for that. It is SD memory that's compatible with this motherboard, but it's just a really good, well-rounded motherboard for this application. One thing you have to be mindful of, of these particular motherboards, and generally the motherboards of the time, is leaky capacitors. So you can see all these little cylindrical items here are capacitors, and you need to make sure that you don't have any signs of obvious bulging or any sort of leakage on the motherboard, because when that happens, the electrolytics that are inside of these leak on the motherboard and damage all the different traces and you know, neighboring components, if you will. So you wanna make sure that you don't have any of those uh, experiencing that, you know, plague, so to speak. And I'm looking around here and I don't see any of these experience or at least visually show any of that. So that's good news. And the next component we're gonna be utilizing in this system is a platter hard disk made by Samsung. It's a 40 gigabyte drive running at 7,200 RPM. Anybody who's seen this channel knows that I specifically love utilizing the platter drive, spinning rust as it is nicknamed in the industry. And I'll tell you that, you know, I've had a lot of great luck with these in my retro builds. There's something about listening to the, you know, the clicking and the ticking of the hard disk while it's loading and booting up and then experiencing that feeling of that slight delay while Windows is loading or you're trying to load a game and it's accessing the data. And, you know, it's just the experience that you have. Now, you don't have to do that. You can go and get compact flash to IDE or SSD to IDE adapters and things like that that will allow you to utilize flash memory or solid state drives in these retro builds. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, that's totally fine. I just have a huge stockpile of these and, you know, I am experiencing a few of them going bad, of course, over the years, but as long as I have them, I'm going to continue to utilize them in these builds. So that's the hard disk that we'll be utilizing today. Okay, in terms of the sound card, now this is something that I debated quite a bit on for this build. I actually was speaking to a friend of mine and uh, got his opinion and I'm going to be going with a Sound Blaster 16 card in this build for a couple of reasons. So we have a Sound Blaster CT2950 sound card, just a beautiful looking sound card that just has a huge array of compatibility, everything from the Windows based games all the way to the DOS based games and having that real hardware support for DOS games. And the fact that this motherboard does have that ISA, that one ISA slot, I definitely want to take advantage of that in this build. Again, subjective. This is my thing. This is what I want to do on this build. But another option that we could use and something that I've seen quite a bit online, a lot of people do, and this is actually what <laughs> I was told to uh, or recommended to use, 
was a Sound Blaster Live PCI card. And again, this does have DOS compatibility through different drivers and software and things like that. But I do like to utilize the original Sound Blaster 16 for my Windows 98 sort of builds and the fact that we do have that ISA slot. Now let's talk about the video card. And this is one of those things that is always going to be contentious with people depending on what build that they're building. I do have this AGP slot here on this motherboard that I could be taking advantage of. In this particular build, what I want to put in the system is not AGP, it is PCI. And I do realize I am limited by that a little bit. However, it is a 3DFX Voodoo 3 3000 video card. I love the flexibility and the compatibility of this card. And I've used this in other builds. I've actually used this in one of my retro builds that I have quite a bit. I have a couple of these cards and I have a couple of Voodoo 3 2000 cards. I did some research online about what people are using in these particular builds. And, you know, this came up quite a bit. They love the retro feeling of this, whether it's PCI or AGP. Obviously, AGP is more... Uh, more favored, but I, I don't have an AGP at this time. I could be using a Radeon card. I could be doing different things, of course, that are better than this card and would obviously give you greater range later in the time that this hardware allows you to go into, specifically later operating systems. To be honest with you, my gaming experience and the things that I did back in the day really focused on games that were more than enough compatible for this particular card. Okay, and the final thing I'm going to show here is a network card. So this is one of those network cards I pulled out of one of the eWay systems that I was given on another channel. And I didn't know what this card was, actually. I just pulled it out. It's just an Ethernet card. It's PCI, and it just was it was in one of my dual Pentium systems. And it was two of these, actually. It had two of these cards side by side, so they were running in tandem. And essentially, I was told in the comments that this is actually an Intel card. And are very compatible and work very well. So I, the reason I'm installing a network card in the system is not necessarily to go on the internet because people have asked me that, why do you want to put a network card? You know, why would you want to go on the internet with this? And how can you, and all those questions. It's not about that for me. It's about getting it on a local network to be able to network a couple of these systems together to transfer files over to this computer if I want to, whether it's games or other things basically other forms of connectivity as opposed to just sticking to you know cds dvds uh, thumb drives and things like that so definitely like to have that ability in this computer plus hey we have the expansion available to be able to do that and here we have the case the famous aopen kf 45a tower and this is something that i used quite a bit growing up in terms of uh, building my systems. It was definitely a budget-friendly case, but built very well. I love the fact that it has three five and a quarter inch bays, plus we have a couple of three and a half inch bays here as well for expansion and compatibility. Plus, I love the ivory cases. We have our ATX power supply, which we are going to do a load test on. Uh, I do have the, the tester here, the power supply tester that we have, plus I have a hard disk to put under load on the system. So I want to make sure that we don't have any issues. Now, sneak peek, I did use this system for another build previously, so I do know it works, but I want to go through the process of doing that test. We also have the IO shield here. Now, I'm not sure if this IO shield is going to line up with that uh, with that motherboard. I believe it will. I mean, the motherboard obviously does not have a game port or audio jacks on the back of the motherboard. I'm hoping it does line up. If not, I'll have to order one for the system and we'll go without the back IO shield. And on the back here, we have lots of expansion, lots of different cooling options here in terms of the airflow in the system, which is really nice. So I feel that this is a well-rounded case. I feel back in the day, I built several. When I say several, I mean several systems utilizing this case when I sold them to customers. And this is something that was very, very well received uh, in the market. And the last thing I'll call out before we start turning things around here is an optical drive. So one thing I forgot to mention is I have an Asus quiet track 52 speed CDRW drive. I'm gonna be utilizing this drive because this is something that uh, first off, I found in the thrift store, I fe featured this in one of my thrift find videos. And yeah, I just want to be able to have this in the system plus has an Asus motherboard. Why not put in an Asus optical drive as well? So we're going to be utilizing that in this system.
Okay, so what we're going to do now is get that motherboard all back on the bench and get it all kind of cleaned up and prepared for this build. Okay, so we have our motherboard on the bench and yeah, it's a little dirty here. I mean, you can see where the fan airflow has been. You can see the marks on the chipset heatsink here, as well as just some dust and dirt around here. And one of the things I failed to mention when we were talking about the capacitors is the capacitors I find closest to the CPU are the ones that do the most bulging because of the heat in this area from the processor itself. I mean, we're not going to do anything fancy in the motherboard. The motherboard overall is very, very clean. As you can see, it's just the dirt around this area. So all I do is take an anti-static uh, brush here and we're just going to move, kind of dust it off here. Get all this dust out of the way. Get the thick off, as they say, uh, out of this area. Specifically around this, um, especially around the slot itself, because you can see how much dirt and dust is around this area here. And I want to make sure that when we insert the CPU again, it makes great contact. We also have contact cleaner we're going to be utilizing here. So we want to be absolutely sure that it's going to be perfect when it comes to connecting into the, uh, connecting the CPU in the slot itself. Now what I want to do is take some spray isopropyl alcohol. I'm using 70%. That's fine for what I'm doing here. I mean, I tend to like to use the 99% because it dissipates faster. It just means that it takes a little longer to dissipate when you're using it. I mean, overall, the motherboard is in great shape, as I mentioned earlier. It's more so around just the CPU area where it was actually drawing in all that, uh, all that uh, dust and dirt and grime. Okay, so we've sprayed it with the alcohol there, the IPA, and it's looking really good now. And we'll let that kind of dissipate for now while uh, while we're waiting for that. And while we're doing that, we're gonna look at the CPU itself. We wanna make sure that we get this cleaned up as well. There's no need to put a dirty CPU in here. Okay, there's the fan removed, and you can see it's quite a bit of dirt and grime on the heatsink of this CPU due to the fan. We'll look at the fan here in a moment. I mean, the fan feels like it's moving just fine. I'm not worrying about re-oiling that or doing anything with that. We'll just give it a good cleaning. And the same thing with this. Now, this is a cooler master heatsink and fan. This would have originally come with, at least I believe, with an Intel base. It would have been replaced before. And you can see, look at the dirt coming off of this. Just look at that. I mean, again, these are just Hoover vacuums, right? I mean, as soon as you turn these on, it just promotes airflow and that's the idea. But along with airflow comes all those uninvited dust bunnies along the way. Okay, we're just gonna use our anti-static brush here to get in between all the different fins and give this a good cleaning. Now I'm taking the brush to the fan as well. I'm holding the fan in place while I do this so it doesn't do any damage. And I'm just doing this to get the thick off, essentially, because the rest will have to come off with the toothbrush and IPA. Mmm, all that dirt from someone else. <laughs> okay, let's get that cleaned up and start working on the fan. Okay, we have our fan and heatsink all cleaned up in our beautiful slot one Pentium 3 600 CPU in front of us here. So very nice to have that all clean. And before you ask, you know, I thought this was a Windows 98 build computer. Well, I wanted to show that uh, you definitely need to make sure that everything has been prepared for the system to be built. And this is just one of those things that you have to do as part of this process, is make sure everything is nice and clean. Specifically, if you're using parts that you found in either thrift stores or donated to you, or you find online, not everything is 100% is, uh, um, clean and ready to go. So it's just one of those process things. Okay, the other thing I'm gonna do is spray some of this contact cleaner in here. Uh, there we are, nice and easy. Now that that's all clean and ready to go, we're gonna be inserting our CPU into the slot. I mean, it's fairly straightforward. Just make sure your guides are in place. Slide it down in place into the slot. And again, you don't need to force anything. Just make sure it's aligned and push down. And here we go. You see, it just clips right in. Nice and easy, no big deal. That's the nice thing about slot one and uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty straightforward. The other thing we have to do to make sure that you don't forget doing, because I tend to do this quite a bit and forget, is plug in the 
uh, power to the CPU fan, which I just did now. Okay, the other thing I like to do at the same time while the motherboard is out of the system is install the memory. So we'll get that installed now. So we have our memory in place. We have all the dip switches. I'm just double checking to make sure everything's set to zero. I did check the motherboard manual and it is showing that it is using the BIOS software to be able to manage the CPU frequency and all the, those good things. And yeah, it's definitely looking much cleaner. One thing I'm gonna do as well is grab a CR2032 battery and pop that in while it's here. There's our brand new fresh coin cell battery. Nice, clipped in there, all ready to go. To hold a bunch of settings for years to come. Okay, let's get the bench all set up and different camera view to be able to start installing all these components in that A-open case. Let's go. Okay, and we're all set back up on the bench. Just a different view, of course, for everyone to see what's going on in the build. We have a beautiful motherboard kind of hanging out over here. So we have our power supply tester, pretty straightforward. Uh, you can get these online. Thank you to everybody who's recommended for me to get one of these. Good to test out the power supply because I have damaged a motherboard once um, for the channel actually, <laughs> because I plugged in the bad power supply. So we'll just plug in our ATX power into the power supply tester. We'll take our Molex, plug that in as well. So we can test the different rails as well as the floppy connector here. Get those all connected properly. There we are. And I do realize that some of these power supplies don't test correctly unless we have a load. So I do have a hard disk here that we're gonna plug in. I know it does not access any data, but does spin up. So we'll have that uh, plugged into the Molex here as well. Just pop it on there. And let's go ahead and plug this in and see if we have everything working fine. Okay, you can see all the voltages there are looking good. So our minus 12 volt rail is looking good. We have our five volt, our plus five volt, our plus 12 volt here, as well as our 3.3 volt. Everything is looking on spec. So it's nice to see everything within reason there. And uh, yeah, so power supply from what I'm seeing here is looking good and no issues. So no reason for me not to continue on using this power supply. The inside of this beautiful open case. And I love the cases because these were built very well. Not that cheap aluminum stuff that I had came in later cases. This is definitely some heavier gauge metal that's really nice to have in a case to keep everything really sturdy, uh, even though you know we don't even have anything populated at this moment. The other thing I like about this case is the versatility. So you do see that we have several different type of standoff mounts here to be able to hook up various types of motherboards. In fact, there was a small, much smaller motherboard that was in this case prior to me uh, utilizing it for this build. So it's nice to see that. And then, so what I've done here, I've used a nut setter here to be able to install all the various standoffs that I have for this motherboard. So it was quite simple. What you do is just basically take the motherboard, make sure you look at the different design on the case, and make sure that everything aligns and get all the standoffs where they need to be. Okay, so we're gonna pop in this into the back IO and hope that it lines up. It does, okay. So that IO shield is going to work for us. Okay, the next step is to make sure all my standoffs are correct. So we have one here, one there, one here, and one here, which is awesome, and then two down here. If you also notice, there was a couple of rubber grommets that were under the motherboard that are just like stick-ons that kind of go underneath just to hold it in place as well. In case you're pushing down on the motherboard, you don't risk any sort of fracturing of the PCB. Okay, these are pretty straightforward to install. Just important that I, I kind of just leave them finger loose there for a little bit, for a moment just to make sure that I get everything kind of lined up. And then once everything is lined up, then I feel really good about it. Then we can start to tighten everything down. Now the motherboard is now all mounted in using those six screws and you can see it's very secure in the case and perfectly aligns with that back IO shield, which is wonderful. The other thing I'm gonna do is get the optical drive installed and the floppy disk drive installed. Now there's screws on the other side of this. I'm gonna get those off camera. When we go to stand this up, I'll get those four screws installed. But essentially the other two screws on the side of the floppy and the optical and ultimately the hard disk. So the next thing we'll do then, speaking of hard disk, is install that. 
Now let's start populating all the different expansion cards. So the first thing we're gonna do is install the video card. This is the 3DFX video card. I'm gonna install it in the very first PCI slot. Now these cards give off a pile of heat. <laughs> And uh, I like to give it a little bit of uh, room in the case for sure. Pop in our network card. Okay, so we have our two cards there. So we have our video card and our PCI card here for our network card. And we're going to now install the ISA card, which is our Sound Blaster 16. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is start to connect all the different power and data cables. The very first thing we're gonna do is connect this ATX power cable to the motherboard. I don't have a shorter data cable here. Let me just look. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have a short data cable, but I do have the uh, do have it wrapped up here. So essentially what we're gonna do is connect this side to the motherboard into the secondary port. It is labeled there, pin one. So the red stripe goes towards pin one on the motherboard. And the same thing to the optical drive itself. Okay, pretty straightforward. And the same thing goes with the power for the Molex. So we'll put the red to red. So you notice the red power on the Molex connector goes towards the red pin on the data cable. Okay, we have that connected now. Okay, coming down to the floppy drive is next here, just because it's next in line. We'll install the power cord or power cable. Okay, so we have our floppy data cable here. And the nice thing about this is that we actually have the connectors for both the three and a half inch and the five and a quarter inch floppy in case I decide to put one in this machine. I see pin one here, so we're just gonna pop that on. I think this is an odd location. And, you know, cable management is not something that was really a thing back then uh, clearly but we'll do our best here okay so we have that connected now pretty straightforward nothing too too fancy i'd like to get this kind of wrapped up here i'll do that in a moment see if we can get that kind of cleaned up and the same thing with up here once we get the wires all connected so we have our data cable connected to the optical drive and we have our data cable to the floppy we also have our power for both of those as well so the next thing we're gonna do is install the data cable for the hard disk. And because of the type of hard disk it is, we can utilize the, the DMA settings options in the operating system to allow faster transfer rates. And of course, I'm using an 80 conductor IDE cable versus utilizing something like a 40, which would be a different type of uh, cable for slower access speed. Okay, so we have the data connected now for the hard disk, but we don't have the power. I was hoping that power was gonna reach there, but it's not, unfortunately not going to. I'll have to use another Molex in the string that we have. And just, I, I'm trying to promote airflow in this area and just trying to make sure that everything kind of stays out of the way. So overall, it's looking pretty good so far. I mean, I wanna test everything before I start kind of tying everything up and getting everything kind of sorted out here. So the next thing we're gonna do is get all these wonderful, this is the worst part of building a computer. My, <laughs> I, I've done this so many times and you know, getting these all right connected correctly to the motherboard. Now I do have the manual for this motherboard. So I'm gonna go look that up right now and install all the LED and power switch and connectors to the front panel. And of course the speaker as well. I'm gonna do that right now. Okay, now I have that all connected. I have all the different uh, connections to the front there. So you can see in the manual itself. So it's very handy if you can get these manuals online. This comes from the RetroReb is where I ended up getting this from. And I was able to print off the motherboard manual to get exactly what I needed. And that's of course gets me all the different connections to the motherboard. Okay, I think this is looking pretty darn good. Now I'm hoping that <laughs> it agrees with me when I go to turn this on. I'm gonna flip the case around, get it all, uh, get the other screws put on the other side of the optical floppy and hard disk, essentially turn it all around, get a monitor, keyboard and mouse set up on the bench and see if we can get the system posting. Okay, so we're back. And this is not the site I expected <laughs> to bring everyone back to. I was hoping to get ready to hit the power button and turn on the, the computer to a nice, beautiful Asus motherboard or Voodoo 3 BIOS or something on the screen. And none of that happened, of course not, right? Because this is exactly what I talked about at the very beginning about the different challenges and what have you that you run into while trying to get one of these older systems up and running again. So essentially what happened was I turned on the power, tried to turn on the computer and it just, 
the power light came on, the LED came on for the hard disk solid and nothing. I mean, everything was coming on, but there was no beep codes. So I took out the RAM, swapped the memory, that didn't work. I took out the various cards that were installed in the machine, that didn't work. Um, so I took out the video card at the very least, and that didn't work. And then, so I was like, okay, well, I'm not getting any beep codes. So I took the CPU out, thinking that there might be a bent pin in the slot uh, adapter, uh, or it might be an issue with, uh, you know, not being clean enough. So I worked on that for a bit. Then I swapped out the CPU with another CPU. This is the 400 or 450, I think it is. Yeah, 450 Pentium 3 that we have. And that didn't work either. So I was like, okay, well, this is this is weird. You know, is the motherboard dead? It is coming up. The power light on the motherboard's coming on, no problem. So I essentially, after that, I took out the postcard analyzer because I completely forgot I had this. And I popped it in and sure enough, it came up postcode C0. That's it. All the power relays looked great. The It was coming out of reset which is even better. So I knew that it was executing some sort of code, but it was coming up C0 on the post analyzer card. Anyway, after all that, I Googled it because the book tells me it's some sort of cache memory issue. And I went on Google and Google was saying, hey, you know, all the different Vogons and various websites were telling me that there's an issue with the pin inside the slot was bent for the CPU. So I went through and meticulously looked at every single pin, made sure every single pin was working or it was aligned correctly and did some tests. And there was nothing I could find in there that would indicate there was an issue with the CPU pins. And it was so confusing for me. Then I continued to scroll down and someone had mentioned that it was an issue with the power supply. And, you know, we did the test on the power supply. I had this power supply. This was a fully working system with another board, another set of components and everything was working great. And so I have no idea what it was. And I went, okay, well, all right, well, I'll try the power supply. I have a spare brand new one here. Literally it was out of the box before I started the retro recall and I popped it in and <laughs> it posted right away. I have no idea what's wrong with that power supply. It's testing just fine. And for some reason, that power supply is not happy with this motherboard. And, you know, before it's a 350 watt power supply, so I wasn't worried about the actual power consumption, but unfortunately, you know, it just wasn't working. So all that to say, please let me know down in the comments if you've had that experience where your power supply tested just fine, your computer is coming on as if it's like a grounding problem or, you know, it's, it's executing code, post analyzer is showing C0, uh, but it's not doing anything. It won't boot, it won't pass, it won't post. And sure enough, I pop another power supply in and it came up immediately. So, all right, please let me know in the comments. I thought about editing this out, but I wanted this included because I wanted to get some feedback from the viewers to let me know down below. And obviously to try to help other people if they're working on building a machine like this to definitely try out the power supply if that's a, if that's the last resort. All right, I'm gonna get all this put all back together and see if we can get back to the bench and move on with uh, building this Windows 98 PC. Okay, welcome back. We have everything set back up on the bench and everything's put back together with the new power supply that I had kind of draped over the side of the system here a moment ago. Okay, let's put the power on and make sure everything works. Okay, so we have the Voodoo 3 3000 video card BIOS there. Okay, I'm hitting pause here. So we have a Pentium 3 400 megahertz CPU showing 262 megs of memory, so 256 megs of RAM, but that is the incorrect CPU setting here. Let's go in and change that. Yeah, so during last boot up, your system hung for an improper CPU speed setting. So we're just gonna make sure that it's set to 600 megahertz and looks good. We're gonna go to exit and save. And of course we have the um, coin cell in there so it should save all of our settings and just make sure that it shows the right CPU this time. There's our BIOS for video card again, 16 megabytes of RAM. There we go, okay. All right, so it is showing the Pentium 3 600 megahertz with 256 megs of RAM and detecting the Sound Blaster 16 card. Let's go back into the BIOS for a moment. Okay, and here we are. Everything is looking obviously the date and time. I'm gonna get that set right now. Okay, so I have the date and time set there, and we have our legacy drive set up for our floppy, nothing for our B or floppy 3 support. We do have our Samsung 40 gigabyte hard drive detected, and of course we also have our optical drive, or 
Asus Quiet Track is installed, CDRW, everything else looks really good here. And of course, it's showing our 256 megabytes of memory. So in here, we do have our CPU set and everything's enabled. And here it's really cool that you're able to disable the cache if you want to slow down your CPU, specifically for the older games if they're running too quickly. So that's where you would do that. And then, so we also have our legacy support is automatic and that's great to have these newer BIOSes have all these wonderful things installed to allow you to do these, uh, you know, more finer tuning configurations. And we're gonna exit and save changes. Everything looks good in the BIOS. Now, speaking of the BIOS, the version is 1006. I do have the latest version here, 1008, and I am going to do an update of this BIOS. And that's something that you do at your own discretion. I did go online and check the ASUS website, and this is the latest version that is supported by them. And before I move forward, I do have the 40 gig drive already pre-formatted and all that fun stuff, and it is detecting it correctly in the system. So we're gonna A drive for a moment here. And we're going to go to DIR just to see what we have. So we have our BIOS, which is 1008F.004. And then we have our A flash utility here, which is what we're going to do. And then a readme showing the uh, showing the instructions. And I also have a BIOS back here. This is the BIOS backup that I did earlier, uh, just to make sure that I have some sort of uh, backup of this, just in case something does go wrong. Okay, a flash, and it is key to remember this, the 1008F.004. So go into the utility. It's accessing the floppy disk. And here we are. So it shows us the flash memory. It shows us also the current BIOS version, which is 1006 on our BIOS model of the P3B-F and then the date. So we can have the option of saving or updating the BIOS. We're gonna choose two to update the BIOS. And here we are. So it's just asking us basically for where it is. So it's 1008F.004 and it should access it and look for the latest BIOS. Okay, so it's saying that our current version is 1006 and then we're upgrading potentially to 1008 beta 004. Current model is all the information is here and then data BIOS and of course it shows a later date of BIOS. We're good to go, are you sure? Yes. So chip erasing, done, programming. Okay, it says flash successfully. Hit escape to continue. Okay, so I'm going to ex exit the system and we are going to reboot the computer, control delete, take out the floppy and see if it does detect the latest BIOS is 1008. Okay. So we have successfully flashed the BIOS on the ASUS P3B-F. You can see here that it's 1008 beta 004. And I usually steer, steer away from beta releases when it comes to the BIOSes. However, ASUS did uh, indicate on their website, as well as the retro web, that this has been tested and works. I'm gonna hit Dell to enter the setup and we'll take a look at our new BIOS. I mean, essentially it's the same look, obviously, but uh, just gonna go in here and make sure that everything else is good. To my understanding, this corrects some issues with uh, with um, different operating systems, uh, with the hardware and things like that. So definitely something to do and to think about if you are running into problems. I mean, the BIOS that came with this particular board, I think there's five versions. This would have been the second last version. And uh, so it was a relatively newer version. We probably wouldn't have run into any issues, but it's nice to make that part of the steps that we're going to do. Okay, so after all that's been done, now we're going to install Windows 98 Second Edition into the system. Okay, we're gonna start with CD-ROM support. Okay, so we have our CD-ROM drive according to this is installed. Let's do EDIR to make sure it's good. It's reading the disk drive. Yep, so it looks good. Okay, what I'm gonna do here is copy the Windows 98 folder over to the hard disk to make the installation slightly faster versus utilizing directly from the CD drive itself. So we're just gonna create a directory uh, on the C drive, MKDIR, uh, we're gonna call it Win98. And then we're gonna copy everything from the folder Win98 over to the new folder that I created called Win98 on the C drive. 
So there we are, we're copying all the files over to the hard disk as we speak. Now one thing I'm noticing is that the hard disk light is staying solid. I did play with that a few moments ago, uh, trying to get this light to go out and uh, read the hard disk activity correctly. It's not the front panel I.O. There's an issue there. I'm going to have to do some troubleshooting with the multimeter and just see what uh, what's causing that to not work correctly. Okay, so it's copying the rest of the files. And by doing this to the hard disk, installing them directly, you just get better access rates and speeds while you're installing the operating system. And also, you're going to do this anyway as a good practice after you've installed the operating system. So therefore, if you're installing any future hardware or drivers or things like that, that you don't always have to go and find the Windows 98 CD and pop it in. You can just direct that program or that installation to look at the C backslash Win98 folder and all the cab files will be installed there. Okay, 101 files copied, we're good. So we're gonna go CD Win98 and there's all of our files installed. We're gonna go to setup and it says we're going to do a system check, which is your standard uh, good old scan disk from Microsoft. No errors. That's uh, good to know. We'll let exit there. Okay. And here we are at the Windows 98 setup, everybody. And of course, everybody has seen this more than once. So I'm going to do a nice little montage for everybody. We're going to go to the end of this and get everything set up on this computer. Let's go. And here we are with Windows 98 installed on the computer and I'm just going to uncheck that show screen and hit close. Uh, pretty default installation, uh, nothing too fancy here. We're going to my computer for a moment under our device manager just to see what we don't have installed, I should say. Okay, it does detect the Intel adapter, the actual uh, network adapter. I don't have to worry about that. Display adapters, yeah, I didn't expect it to pick up that just yet and of course we have unsupported device we have a bunch of stuff we have to install here okay one of the best practices that you do before you continue on with any of the installation specifically if you're building a machine like this is to make sure that you go to your manufacturer's website of the motherboard and you get the latest chipset drivers required for the operating system it's always a good practice just brings everything up to date We're going to restart for sure. You can see now it's installing all of the chipset drivers and yeah, it's very important you do all these things to make sure that everything is good to go. And like I said, this is a very compatible chipset. So very important that again, you install these things. It, it basically reduces the likelihood of issues later down the road as you're installing other hardware, not to mention, um, you know, there's some things missing that as we were installing the operating system, it did detect some hardware that it wasn't able to recognize and this allows you to do that. Okay, so we do have the video card to install. Okay, welcome to 3DFX Tools. Yes, absolutely, we'll accept the license. Go through the installation. Now, I don't recall if this installs the drivers as well or, do, yeah, okay, I think it's installing the drivers as well. Uh, that'll be good news. Uh, it's nice that it comes with its own installation versus having to do it. You must restart your configuration for it to take effect. Yes, we definitely restart. Okay, we're back to the Windows desktop. As you can see, it's much better visual than we had before. Let's go into Device Manager real quickly here and take a look at that. And sure enough, we have the 3D effects Voodoo 3 installed 
and looking really good in that device manager. Same thing down here under 3DFX. We do have the ability to go in and configure the video card through the 3DFX tools that we have installed as part of this installation. So that's really good news. And of course, we also have the Sound Blaster 16 plug and play installed. Okay, so we have all that installed. Now let's take a look at some other things while we're here. Thank <laughs> you. 
This isn't right. Where is everyone? Help me. What ails him? He looks to be diseased. And here we are at the end with our Windows 98 system. I'm just absolutely happy with how this turned out. My nostalgia is going overboard. It has everything that I needed to do and then some. In terms of the Pentium 3 600 processor, the 256 megabytes of memory we have in it, we have the Voodoo 3 3000 video card, 40 gigabyte hard disk drive, and that beautiful Asus motherboard with just an array of expansion capabilities that we can do with that. And again, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, this is very subjective. Windows 98 era had a wide range of hardware you could use. And this is just the hardware that I chose. This is the hardware that I'm using as a base config. And then I can go and expand from here if I choose to do so. However, again, the Sound Blaster 16 audio card that I put in here, the same thing with the Voodoo 3 3000 video card. I mean, that opens up a wide range of games in this era, which is what I was aiming for with the backwards compatibility with some of the older games as well. And I have lots of those to choose from. And I definitely wanted that for this build. Now, 
Can you upgrade? Absolutely. If you want to go with a Sound Blaster live card, you can do that or more. You can upgrade the video card to a different type of video card that will give you an even later range of compatibility with later software, later games. And again, like that's why I mentioned this was subjective and I'm happy with wow, this turned out. I love the capabilities that that Voodoo 3 3000 card gives to the system. I, I got lost playing for quite a while. I've edited it quite down in this video, but you know, I'm gonna be using this system with more to come. I mean, this is a beautiful looking system. I, I just love the look of the A-Open case and it's just in superb condition and everything's working absolutely wonderfully. And this is exactly what I was looking for. And I hope I've inspired you to <laughs> do a similar build if you choose to do it on retro hardware to be able to experience the feeling of the retro games on real hardware, and as in this case. That said, if you liked today's video, please give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Makes a world of difference. Helps the channel grow. Tells YouTube you like the content you're seeing. Please hit the notification button. Change it to all you'll be notified of new content such as this. Please leave a comment down below. What Windows 98 build do you have today? Do you prefer running on retro hardware or do you prefer using emulation? I love hearing the comments, love the interaction on the channel. I respond to absolutely every comment. Thank you so much for watching. Always making new content. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.